Hallelujah. Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to Isaiah chapter number 13. Isaiah chapter number 13. Isaiah chapter number 13 tonight, and just a little bit of an introduction. In this chapter, we enter into a new section of the book of Isaiah. The first uh, 12 chapters, uh, we saw there is a segmentation of the iniquity of these people and the Lord's uh, chastening of their wickedness, but then ultimately the Lord is going to be exalted, and time and time again we see the back and forth between this. Almost one chapter is bad, one chapter is good. One chapter's bad, one chapter's good. Half of a chapter's bad, half a chapter's good. And it's just kind of back and forth. And again, as I've mentioned several times, it can be repetitious, but the Lord has put it down here uh, because we're hard-headed. <laughs> we need to constantly be told. We need to constantly be reminded of these things over and over and over again. But from chapter 13 all the way to chapter number 23, that's 10 chapters, uh, we're going to be observing the future judgment or, as it says in Isaiah chapter 13, and verse number 1, the burdens of the enemies of Judah. That word burden in this context means judgment. Um, and so that's, that's what's said here. Let's read verse number 1. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse number 1. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. So this new section of, of Isaiah continues all the way through that chapter number 23, and it contains prophecies about and against other nations. And these are revelations from the Lord through Isaiah about events and judgments to come against the enemies of and around Israel. Now, according to verse number 18, let's understand our context here. Let's read verse number 18. Uh, the Bible says, or excuse me, verse number 19, not 18. The Bible says, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, Excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Why do I mention verse number 19? Because it gives us an understanding or a definition of that word Babylon in this chapter. It is actually, it's, Babylon is its own place, but Babylon is also a euphemism or a synonym for all of the nations that are against God in this particular context. It's kind of like when you say, hey, does anybody have any post-it notes? Okay. There's plenty of other brands out there of post-it notes. Some people say sticky notes, some people say this. But everybody knows, okay, post-it notes mean one thing, but it's representative of all those that may be in similar fashion. So the name Babylon here is mentioned in this context. And, and more than any other city, Babylon seems to be the personification of the forces of the world against God. And, and nowhere... In the scripture, is it more clear than the place where Babylon finds its roots, which is Babel. Babel. You all know what happened at the Tower of Babel? The people of the world were in union. They they finally come together. They had all decided that they were going to be of one mind and of one accord. It was world peace. But do you know why they had come together for one purpose? Because they were going to be together against God, okay? So that's why Babylon here is mentioned in this context. Now, another thing to understand is verse number 6 tells us the timeline of these events. Verse number 6, the Bible says, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. So this phrase in verse number 6, the day of the Lord, tells us when these things are going to come to pass. In fact, we find this phrase, the day of the Lord, 31 times throughout the Old and the New Testament. And it is identified as the ultimate event when Christ will establish His authority, when He eradicates all evil, and He brings lasting peace to the universe on a universal scale. And so this... These two contexts, understanding that Babylon is a type of the world and that the timeline of, of events that's taking place is talking about the future judgment that's to come on the earth that's not even here appeared, uh, will, will give way to the subsequent interpretation. Now, I will, I will say this. The main view in chapter number 13 is, here's a big fancy theological term, eschatological. That means 
end times, end times prophecy, those uh, end times theology. That's eschatological. That's what that means. And that is the main thrust of verse number 13. However, in verses 14 through 18, it does appear that there is an immediate fulfillment, which is the context of those verses as well. Um, and I'll just go ahead and tell you this. Babylon was destroyed in 539 B.C. And the people of Judah, which were taken captive by Babylon, were allowed to return. The exiles returned. God overthrew Babylon. So there's this partial fulfillment of what God has said. So there's this intermingling of, uh, yes, mostly future, but some immediate context. And I will give credit where credit is due. If it were just me reading chapter number 13 and I didn't have the resources available to me of other men of God who have studied the Scripture, I would not have seen that on the surface. But thank God for commentaries, amen. So the, the commentators are just commentators, but sometimes they taste really good. Praise the Lord. You can, you can make potato chips out of them. Hallelujah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving you what I was given. Now keep in mind, what is being revealed here in chapter number 13 is judgments against foreign nations that were against God. But these revelations, they were not given to warn those nations. They were not given to, hey, hey, y'all, y'all really shouldn't mess with us because God's that. that's not why God... They were written down, they were given by Isaiah for God's people for the purpose of reminding them that they ought to continue to trust Him alone and not in other kings or kingdoms or their gods. You know what? They might be looking at this, and, and Isaiah here is telling them that Babylon is going to be destroyed, and Ahaz is still on the throne, and he's a wicked, ungodly king, and here's Assyria, and Syria is still coming in. And, and they're like, we didn't even know anything about Babylon. And, and he's saying, listen, the word of the Lord is right. God keeps what He says. He's not only the covenant keeper, He's the covenant completer. Amen. His name is Jehovah. Hallelujah. I love that. It's so fun uh, searching that out in the Scripture. And he wants to remind them, hey, listen, God has got your back. God is going to keep you. Don't worry. Listen, I didn't write this down for Babylon's sake to give them a warning. I wrote this down to remind you, don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Don't worry. Even when everything that you can see it seems to be contrary to what is said, you just trust in my word. You just trust in what I said. So, oh, praise God. Here's another reason why we ought to trust the Lord. I love what it says in Isaiah 45 in verse number 22. And I've been doing my best not to quote from Isaiah in places that we haven't already been, but I couldn't help this one. <laughs> uh, but the Lord basically, He was declaring Himself as the God of all nations. He said, don't you worry about Babylon. I'm God over Babylon too. And if I'm your God, that means that I'm still God over you and Babylon. I can take care of it. But it says in Isaiah 45 and verse number 22, it says, Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. I love that. I want to be saved. I want other people to be saved. But I like this little sarcastic remark that the Lord has at the end. Of it. it says, For I am God and there is none else. It's almost like the Lord said, well, I'm looking around. I look to my, my, left hand, or my right hand, and I look to my left hand, and I, I, I look behind me, I looked above me, I looked below me, and I looked before me, and yep, I check. I'm the only God. Hallelujah. Amen. And He's my God. Amen. So the Bible says in chapter 13 and verse number 1, The burden of Babylon which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Now we're going slow at first. We, kick, we, we always pick up. Um, um, some motion towards the end, but I, I do want to point this out to you. Isaiah, as we understand, is whether he's, we're speaking about the immediate fulfillment, which is in 539, which is like 200 years after Isaiah dies, or we're talking about the, the future for fulfillment, which will be at the end of time where Jesus sets up his millennial kingdom. Either way, Isaiah wasn't going to see this thing come to pass. And, and so the Bible tells us that he has this vision. And you say, well, how, how was Isaiah able to see? How, how could he possibly have known these? Well, obviously, Isaiah was supernaturally given the understanding of what was to come. Right? That makes sense. We, we understand that about the prophets. And some of us would say, oh man, it's so cool back in Isaiah's day and Jeremiah's day and Ezekiel's day and Daniel's day and Hosea and Joel and Amos and Obadiah and all these other people. They, they got direct 
revelation from God and God communicated with them and they, they could see things way... I mean, think about John the Apostle. He saw all these things happening in the book of Revelation. Man, it's so cool back in those days. I wish, I wish God allowed us to have those kinds of things to happen. And you know what? He does. The Lord, now, don't be nervous. Just listen all the way, okay? <laughs> We're not going charismatic tonight. All right? But we, we marvel at this amazing ability that God affords Isaiah. But God has promised to do the same thing for you and for me. Uh, now, listen, Isaiah is a penman that has written down the eternal words of God. And the things which he is dealing with are eternal things, and they're national things, and they deal with universal things as well. But, and so, so God, God's not going to tell us who's going to win the 2024 election, okay? Just so we're clearing that up. I didn't find a secret verse in the Bible that lined up with a certain set of numbers that told me that I found Kamala Harris in there. You got thought I was going to say Trump, didn't you? <laughs> I didn't find... There, I'm not saying none of that, okay? All right, but what I, what I am going to say, the Lord, the Lord is willing to give us a vision of our own future. Now, it's not, it might not be what you think. You're not going to have a, a special dream and then see it all play out before your eyes. But the Bible says this in John chapter 16 and verse number 13, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, thus shall he speak. Now, that's okay, preacher, that's good. He's going to guide me. But how is that telling me the future? Well, after that last part, it says, And he will show you things to come. Amen. The, the Spirit of God can give you discernment about your future. The Spirit of God can give you discernment about the decisions that you make today, how they may affect the generations that follow you. The, the Spirit of God, he's, he's given me discernment about, okay, if I, if I give this little bit of compromise in over here, how is my son going to use it to excess? Or if I have this attitude about this situation, or about this person, or about this place, how is my son going to turn that around, and is it going to be positive, or is it going to be negative? The Spirit of God can give me the wisdom that I need to know the future. I bet y'all didn't know that. You didn't know the preacher could see the future. But you, if you're saved, you can see the future tonight too. God can tell you what to do. The Bible says in Psalm 119 and verse number 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet that we can see right where we are, but it's a light unto my path where we can see where we are going. And we could, we could discern the ultimate end of every decision. We could foresee the effects under the third and fourth generation if we were to live in constant communion with the Spirit of God. You, ever, you don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise my hand for you, okay? But you ever just not been right with God? And, and you've just been carnal and fleshy and just not even in sin necessarily, but just, you know, just you, you've forsaken your Bible reading. You hadn't been praying. You're kind of slacking off on church. and You don't really know if you're really in it or out of it. You're not sure. Uh, and, and it seems like you've got all these decisions before you and you don't, you don't have no sense of direction. You can't figure it out. I've been there. It just doesn't seem like there's a, a clear path anywhere. And then the, 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 the Lord just sends a brick down on your forehead and He, and he says, Hey, dummy. <laughs> And you get back in your Bible, and you start praying, and you, you listen to the preaching, and you become involved in the ministry, and all of a sudden things start... It's like, oh, man, I can understand what I'm supposed to do. I can see how this is going to work out. It's almost like I can see the future. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, chapter 13, verse number 2. The Bible says, Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. Now, let me preface this. Let me just be transparent with you tonight. It appears that this verse is just a little ambiguous concerning who it is that's lifting up the banner. Okay, I'm going to submit to you that truth. So... I, I willingly acknowledge to you tonight that my comprehension of this verse could very well be inaccurate. Not, not incorrect, but inaccurate. Um, 
However, I believe that I'm right. <laughs> so, of course, I believe I'm right, right? Uh, but I, I just want to be honest with you about it. So, what I'm fixing to say is what I understood the first time that I came to the text. I felt like the Spirit of God was giving me insight. But there's just this little bit of ambiguity that I must admit to you is there. Uh, I will say this, though. Whether it's one way or the other, it doesn't change the interpretation of the passage, okay? All right, so, so I'll, I'm going to submit that to you. Verse number 1, Isaiah is given the burden of Babylon. He's seeing the judgment to come. And I believe, verse number 2, is speaking specifically to those people that the, the vision was about, those of Babylon. There's, there, that's my logic, okay? It says, Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. Okay, so here the Bible in verse number 2 is speaking in my understanding to Babylon, the world that is against God. And it says in the last part of the verse, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. Okay, I believe that, that they, in the last part, is speaking to the Lord's host. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. That's how I understand this passage. And if you don't agree with me, that's fine. Uh, and I wouldn't even say that you'd be wrong if you don't agree with me. But that's how I'm preaching it tonight. Okay. Uh, verse number 2 says, Lift ye up the banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. Here, I believe that Isaiah is describing the wickedness of the world system as a formal invitation for God's judgment. That is what I believe is taking place. Here, Babylon is under the judgment of God as the vision of Isaiah clarifies. And the Lord is almost saying, everything that you're doing, all your sin, all your iniquity, you might as well just be uh, setting up a banner that says, Welcome <laughs> for, to the judgment of God. You might as well uh, be on the highest precipice of the mountain range around you saying, Hey, we're right here. You might as well be shaking the hand. Like, y'all just come in, y'all. It'll be great. It'll be awesome. And, and that they may go into the gates of the nobles. And, and it's almost as if this place, this Babylon, if you will, is it, 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 it's just yielding to their enemies the most secure and intimate details of their national security. Okay? And, and that's, that's how I'm understanding this passage. These people, they're sinning against God. They are, are going in contradiction to His will. And so, you know what they're doing? They're, they're just kind of, they're asking for judgment. They're just asking for it. They're just, they're just as if they're putting up a big welcome mat for the judgment of God. Just come on in and, and, and take us over. And that's, that's, that's my comprehension of verse number 2. And here's some practical application of that. When we sin against God, it is if it is as if we are inviting punishment. We're opening ourselves up for a bad time. So, verse number 2, I gave you that explanation. Verse number 3, I believe, is speaking of the Lord's host, His army here. Verse number 3. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. You know, it's taken place. The Lord said there's going to be judgment put upon this place. These people are asking for it. They're so wicked. And He said, I'm assembling an army. And I'm going to put together and fortify a people to take you out. And He's going to, he's going to command some, and those are His sanctified. And He's going to call others, and those are going to be His mighty ones. And both of these entities are, 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 are marked by the fact that they rejoice in His Highness. Now, what does that mean? Well, you know, when you, when you talk to a king, what do you say? Your Highness. Amen. So they're, they're submitting and they're rejoicing in the fact that God is their king over them. So I deduce in verse number 3, it's talking about saved people. But these saved people are segmented into two different portions. There is the sanctified and there is the mighty ones. There is the commanded and there is the called. And I believe what is shown here before us in verse number 3 is a, 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 an allusion to the spiritual maturity of Christians. And, and you know what? 
God has sanctified us when we are saved. We're, we're set apart from the world. We're removed from the punishment and the penalty of sin. Hallelujah. We are the sons of God. We've been adopted by the Father. We are sanctified. We're set apart. But you know, when, the, when, when you get saved, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, you're a baby. You're a baby. And... Uh, Babies have to drink milk. I found that out. My goodness, they keep you up all night. Um, and then when they get old enough to start eating food, you still got to command them, don't you? You've got to com- They're weak, and they, they don't do things of their own volition. You've got to tell them what to do, right? Clean your room. Eat all of your food. I mean, for goodness sake, son, it's a waffle with syrup on it. Who doesn't want to eat that? Why would I have to take time to tell you? But still, command, 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 command. Do it. Do it. I'm going to have to tell you again and again and again. And the Lord, you know, when He's dealing with us, a lot of times, we're His sanctified ones. We are His. But we do a lot of things that we do out of obligation. Amen? Instead of appreciation. And, and so we've got this group here. They're, they're just as saved as anybody else, but maybe they're a little immature in their walk with God. Nevertheless, they're going to be a part of it. They're glad that Jesus is their king. But then you've got the mighty ones. The mighty ones. The ones who can eat the strong meat. They've got teeth. They've got a steak knife. They've got A1 sauce. And they're going to eat that whole thing. It's going to be medium well. Not medium rare. That's gross. It's going to be medium well. And they can eat that thing up. And you know what? The Lord, the Lord doesn't have to command them. They love the Lord. And, and, and they've come to understand how much God has done for them. And you know what they're doing? They're just like Isaiah. They're sitting there and they're waiting. Lord, here am I. Send me. All you gotta do, God, all you've got to do is call me and I will go. Lord, do you want me to go to Guyana? Lord, do you want me to go to Eastern Europe? Lord, do you want me to go to the North Pole if there's anybody up there that's not saved? God, I'll go up there. Amen. Whatever you want me to do. So you've got the sanctified and you've got the mighty ones. And I believe you've got a group of saved individuals here that God is commanding some and calling others to go and fulfill His will. Okay, that's that's, that's my premise. Verse number 2, these people are in rebellion against God and they're asking for a bad time. Verse number 3, God's people are being assembled together as, the, Lord, as a, the host of the Lord. And some of them are a little bit more mature than the others. And here's, here's another point of practical application for you tonight. Are you called or are you commanded? How does God have to deal with you? Verse number 4. Verse number four. The Bible says, The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people... A tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. So I, I believe we've got some back and forth going here. Verse number 2 talks about that, that Babylon. Verse number 3 talks about God's people. Verse number 4, I believe, is mentioning again in the first part of the verse, Babylon. And, and here you see just a, a, a conglomerate of individuals, of people of all nations coming together on the high mountains. And they're doing what people do that live in a society. They're eating, and they're drinking, and they're giving in marriage. They're eating, they're drinking, they're giving in marriage. They're just going about their normal daily tasks. Society is going forward as it normally does. And it doesn't seem that there's any real concern or conviction about the Lord or, or what His plans are. And it says that these things that are going on in this society is just a, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together. The world is just going around and around and around she goes. And I'm reminded of what is said in Matthew chapter number 24. The Bible says this, For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know what's happening here? Jesus is coming. Chapter number 13 is telling us that Jesus is coming. And these things, their their life's just going on normal. And look what's taking place behind the scenes. These people are completely oblivious through their ruins while God assembles His ranks. Look at verse number 4, the last part after the colon. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host 
of the battle. I'm not talking about that green bottle, not mustard. Mustereth. You know what he's doing? He's assembling his saints together. He's placing them in rank and file. He's preparing them for the day of judgment. All this is going on while the world spins round and is headed right to hell. That sounds kind of like you and I, doesn't it? Where God is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ and we know that there's a day of great judgment that's going to come upon all the earth and it appears as if the world is oblivious to this fact and God is trying to set us up for this coming judgment and all all the while, the people around us seem like they have no idea what's coming. Verse number 5. Verse number 5. The Bible says, They, speaking again still of God's people, come from a far country, from the end of heaven. I believe this is speaking literally here. You know, Abraham looked for a country and a city whose builder is maker is God. We've, the, the Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if it were not so, I would not have told you. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Where's that? that that's, in, that's in heaven. It's way far. We're just pilgrims passing through. I'm looking forward to that far country. I'm looking for that heavenly home that's bright and fair. I feel like traveling on, but there's going to be a day where we travel back. Verse number 5, they come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of His indignation to destroy the whole land. Now, let's not get too excited about that right now. Some of us are, are that, that red blood in our veins are like, yeah, all right. You know, well, I wonder what type of guns Jesus has, you know. <laughs> he, he doesn't have a gun, he's got a sword, amen. It's, it's, it's better than a gun. Uh, but here in verse number 5, we see when the saints go marching in. And uh, the Bible describes that for us in Jude chapter 1. It says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of His saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among, all, excuse me, among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. But you didn't know that's what that song, When the saints go marching in. There's going to be a bloodbath one day. When the saints go marching in. But that, that's what that's about. Amen. So verse number 5 is telling what is coming. Verse number 6 is another message to the enemies of God. It says, How ye... For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Verse number 7, Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed at one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. You know, the Bible says in 2 Peter that... The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but He's long-suffering to us word. Not willing that any should perish. That is a true statement. He wants all to come to repentance. But then the next verse says, But, He's long-suffering, But the day of the Lord will come. God is going to execute judgment. And it says, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There will be, when the Lord returns, swift destruction. And it will be, the Bible says in a place in Revelation, it says in one hour. It will just be just like that. It says, how? The day, there's nothing you can do. You're at the mercies of God and, and you've waited and waited and waited and you haven't heeded His call and now there's no mercy left, it's only wrath. How? Verse number 8 mentions the, the level of pain. And, and ladies, I think you'll appreciate this here. Uh, the Lord is here trying to describe the worst pain that a person could possibly face. And He mentions the travail that a woman has while she's giving birth. And that there's no pain which could be possibly uh, even more, that could, could come close to that kind of pain. And he uses that illustration here. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's even worse, I've heard, than the man flu. 
And, and now that's pretty rough if y'all have had that before. The man flu is pretty bad. But they say that a woman giving birth is even worse than that. And the Lord uses that as an illustration here to speak of the sorrows, to speak of the pain, to speak of the amazement of the individuals who will be underneath that judgment. Verse number 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Cruel. I didn't think God was cruel. He's not. God's not cruel, if you'll repent. Cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. You know what? In this day of judgment, those that are in opposition to God, the Lord will have no mercy. He will pull no punches. You know what? For those that remain unrepentant, they will be destroyed. And God has designated... His compassion only for those who would respond to His convictions. Look at the, the difference here in these two verses in, in the Psalms and the Proverbs. The Bible says this, says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. So there's a promise of God. If we'll respond to His convictions, if we'll respond to His chastisement, if we'll respond to His, his wisdom and his, his understanding that He gives to us, then He will save us. But verse number 29 and verse number 1, or chapter 29, verse number 1 of Proverbs says this, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. When the Lord comes back in this day, you better howl, because there'll be no rescue. It'll be over. Verse number 10, the Bible says, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. All, all those things that Hollywood is pumping out, all these end time scenarios, all these, there's going to be zombies and there's going to be earthquakes and there's going to be stars falling from heaven and there's going to be, the, the world's going to have a big earthquake, it's going to split in half. Anything that you can possibly imagine, the Lord said, here's it coming. It's coming. It's going to happen. It, it, it reminds me of a verse the Bible says in Romans chapter uh, 10 and verse number 8, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach. All these people, they don't even know it. They don't even understand that what they're doing is just preconditioning people to expect what God has already said is going to come. Verse number, verse number 10 tells us that everything's going to be dark in the sun, the moon... The light of the stars is not going to shine. You know why? Because in that day, when judgment comes, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, the only thing that people will be able to see is the brightness of His coming. Now imagine, imagine not being saved. Imagine living through all those years of tribulation and the mark of the beast and the, the witnesses of God and the false witness and having opportunity to be saved and still rejecting God. And here you see the, the, the sun's got turned off, the lights are turned off, There's no and, and way out there in the distance, way far away, you can't quite see, from, all, all, from a far country, from the end of the heaven, there's just this little pinprick of light that starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and bigger. And for the first time, somebody will say this in its proper context. They would say, oh my God! Because it'll be God. That'd be a scary day. I want to I be on the Lord's side in that day. But here, here in verse number 11, here's what he says he's going to do. And I will punish the world for their iniquity, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Now let me, let me put this in perspective to you. And I'm telling you, we're running quickly now. We're almost done tonight. But all the gold that has ever been discovered to, to this date... If, if it was put together, it would fit into a cube of 75 feet by 75 feet by 75 feet. That's a bunch of gold. I mean, you literally could not fit that cube inside of this sanctuary. That's a big bunch of gold. Wow, that is impressive. But 75 feet by 75 feet by 75 feet. 
it's not as impressive when you compare it to the volume of the earth. Now, this is an estimate because I, I didn't have a scale big enough to go out and weigh the earth. Um, but the, 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 the guesstimate is the volume of the earth, if we were to put it into a cube, it would be 941 trillion feet by 941 trillion feet by 941 trillion feet. Now, if you've got a 75 foot by 75 foot by 75 foot cube put up next to the volume of the earth, it's not very significant, is it? And the, <laughs> it would be like a speck of sand on the beach. And the Lord says, when I come back and I destroy all these miserable sinners, men are going to be so scarce, they'll be more scarce than gold is in the dirt. It's going to be a bad day. It's going to be a bad day for all those who oppose the Lord. Verse number 13. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of His fierce Anger. I want you to turn real quickly with me to Revelation chapter number 6 and just see how this is expanded on it. It's, a, it's the same context, it's the same material, but there's new revelation given literally in the book of Revelation. Uh, revelation chapter 6 and verse number 12. Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 12. The Bible says... And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell, uh, fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, this is terrifying. I mean, could you imagine the heaven? I mean, this is the most amazing thing. The heaven departed as a scroll. Verse number 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and of the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? I'm thankful I'll be able to stand in that day. He's able to keep me from falling. Verse number 14. Now, this, this portion of Scripture here is the context is the immediate fulfillment in the days of 539 B.C. when Babylon was put uh, or, or, or over, overthrown um, in those days. So let's read those things in their proper context. Verse number 14. And it shall be as the chaste roe, and as a sheep that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people, and flee every one into his own land. Now, these, these uh, people of Judah, they are, they are under the siege of other powers and nations who seem to be so strong and so, so powerful. And, and he said, hey, don't worry about this. There's going to come a day where those people will run away like little kitty cats. Those people are going to run away like a deer that gets spooked or a horse that gets spooked or, or a pig or, or, or some type of animal. that They're just going to run away and they're going to be so scared they're going to run all the way back to where their home place is. Verse number 15. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through and everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. So there's going to be a slaughter of the people of Babylon and it will cause the return of the remnant to the land of promise. Verse number 16. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Why did I want to make sure to put this in its proper context? Because first of all, Jesus Christ doesn't sin. Amen. And, and so He's not going to do anything that, that God wouldn't do because He is God. Uh, but we still understand that, that judgment comes and, and God uses... Wicked, ungodly nations to bring judgment when His people won't allow Him to work in them. And then the same is true contrary-wise. Verse number 17, Behold, 
I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver. And as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare the children. Now, maybe you're thinking in your mind, how could God allow such an awful thing to happen to these poor, innocent children? And, and mind you, if they are children, they are poor and they are innocent. Absolutely, there's no, there's no doubt about it. But instead of asking that question, I'm going to ask a different one. How cruel is it to reject God and subject your children to His wrath because of your unbelief? I think we ought to be thinking along those lines. Amen. Amen. Verse number 19, the Bible says, In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency shall be when God overthrows Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pinch, pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Oh, what's that? I looked it up, and, and every commentator either said it's, it's either a goat or a monkey. So your pick. A goat or a monkey, whichever one you think it might be. The Bible is telling us here, God God is going to bring swift judgment on this place who is against Him. And in, in the final judgment against Babylon, it will be so complete that the land will forever be desolate. And the only thing that will dwell in the land is animals. Verse number 22. And the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant places, palaces. And her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. Two things, and we'll be finished tonight. The time is near to come. And Isaiah was written about 700 years before Christ came. And it's been 2,000 years approximately since Christ rose again from the dead. And let me remind you that the Bible says a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day, and so therefore time is relative to God. God just operates on His own schedule. Amen. You know why? Because He's God. But what we understand is that when he says near to come, what does that mean? Imminent. could happen at any moment. And when he he does come, it shall not be prolonged. When it's time, it's time. There's not going to be any begging. There won't be any pleading. No request will be taken to allow for another chance. God has given space to repent. And if it is not taken, He will destroy. Now how much more does that put a a, a necessity on us to minister the gospel of truth? How much more does that make it imperative for us to live a life that's pleasing in His sight? Because when He comes, He comes. When, When He's here, He's here. And... When He appears, I don't want to be ashamed before Him at His coming. And when He appears, I don't want to have that loved one or that that friend or that acquaintance or that that passerby. Uh, I don't want to leave them without a witness for Jesus Christ. So, judgment's coming, but we won't be judged. We'll be part of the wrecking crew. Hallelujah. But those that were coming with the Lord to be the ten thousands of His saints, those individuals now have the opportunity to join our number. So let us go forth and minister the Word of God so that those, instead of being on the wrong side of history, they can be on the Lord's right hand. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. Thank you for Isaiah chapter number 13. Lord, help us, God, to take these truths in our lives, Lord, that we would pay attention to them. And Oh, God, we pray, Father, as we leave this place tonight, we ask, Lord, that you keep us safe. Prepare us for the days ahead, and God, that you'd have your will and way in our personal walk with you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.